Thanks, Jeff. This is a very, very generous introduction. Um, and I really can't begin uh, without first thanking Jeff and Jeffrey DeLillo also for um, really for everything that they've done here. I mean, I don't know if you realize how precious this reading series and uh, what you've created at the University of, His uh, um, University of um, Houston Victoria is because there's so many forces trying to turn literature into like a commercial product. Um, and, uh, and Jeffrey and Jeff has kind of made this space for literature to exist in more of a free range straight state or since we're in Texas, I like to think of it as the Wild West, <laughs> the Wild West of literature. So I'm, I'm going to read um, two pieces today. The first one's a, a short one. Um, and I thought I'd read it because it, uh, you know, it's part of a longer work that I'm working on. I thought I would read it today because it seems to speak to the political moment that we're all going through together. And by together, I really mean together. Um, I'm not sure whether to call it adventures in communication or endurance. So let me read it. And maybe you can help me figure that out. Is this, is this mic dead? Or? Oh, no, it's just the Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's the special mic. It's ABC News. Uh, <laughs> they heard politics. Cool. So. Yeah, yeah, it's like the UN up here now all of a sudden. You got one here, too? <laughs> Right after she slammed the door, he received through the mail slot, yes, it was definitely addressed to him, an offer to buy a cemetery plot. Bon voyage, she'd shouted, but not in a warm or friendly way, as at going away parties, or funerals when people console you by saying things like, when you are down, you can only go up. Bon voyage, amigo, actually, even though that also meant, when you are up, you can only go down, as in, he wasn't going anywhere, she was, walking out, as the saying goes, the way amigo can mean friend or jerk, dude or guy. The way guy can mean amigo, dude or asshole, excuse my French, depending. Just as he was trying to explain to her back, we're just friends. At least he thought she'd said amigo, though through the slam that last part was hard to understand. As when they say, at true north, you can only go south. Would be just like her, though, to say good journey in a tone associated with expletive you, excuse my French, when she was the one leaving walking out, as the expression goes, mixing signals. Obviously, the converse is true. When you are at true south, you can only go north, though no one ever says that. The way no one ever tells you, when you are up, you can only go down, except maybe cemetery plot salesmen. Life is short. Even though everyone thinks it, at least sometimes, pilots, undertakers, shouldn't they be called overtakers, flight attendants, or underputters? Passengers, travelers, all thinking, when you are in an airplane, all roads lead down. Unless the plane is so high, it can only go up, like a rocket. But who rides in those? Astronauts, maybe, en route, excuse my French, to the moon. In which case, the moon becomes down and Earth up. Half-ass backwards was another of her favorite expressions. Ipso facto, when you're at true north, north doesn't exist. Why doesn't anyone say, excuse my Latin? Makes no sense. <laughs> Someone should have told that to Shackleton. Christ, she sighed the time he pointed that one out. But really, his point being, the adventurer Ernst Shackleton risked his life chasing something that didn't really, really exist. So shoot me, I didn't make the world. Shackleton failing to be the first to reach true north, as if, then failing to be the first to reach true south, as if, set out for the glory of being the first to sail between the two. Kind of ironic how he named his ship Endurance, instead of obstinance, or sufferance, or deluded, or resignation, pig-headedness, or stubbornness. Sixty miles from the South Pole, he made the decision to push on into thick flows where his ship became trapped in ice. Houston, we have a problem here, as the saying goes, though of course Shackleton probably didn't say that at the time. The saying coming from Apollo 13, now there's a number, en route, excuse my French, to the moon, when someone screwed up and two poles of a battery actually did touch, sparking an explosion that left them unable to get either up or down or down or up, depending. Nel mezzo de camin di nostra vita, excuse my Italian, 
in the middle of the journey of our life, I came to myself within a dark wood where the straight way was lost. Why does every word have to be a magician sawing himself in half? Huh? Have, being the half of the word that Hollywood sawed off when they made the movie, Apollo 13, the movie. The actual phrase the astronaut radioed back being, Houston, we've had a problem here. A good news, bad news scenario. The good news being we have enough oxygen for two days. The bad being it'll take four to get home. <laughs> like Shackleton when the ice closed in and crushed his endurance, forcing him and his crew to abandon ship, walk on water. Frozen, of course, the good and bad news. Hollywood was afraid to use the astronaut's actual words. His use of the plural present perfect, we have had, would make the audience members think the problem was past. Get up and walk out, abandon ship, bon voyage, thinking that the problem or movie was over or something like that. Lack of endurance, a problem of communication, lack of stamina or tolerance, patience, acceptance, persistence, tenacity, resolution, charity, indulgence, understanding, or willingness to make opposites meet. Bon voyage, like Shackleton, who after leaving his crew frozen in place, managed to make his way back up north, then returned down south to res rescue all but three who had died for his mission. Sorry, old chap. For which he was hailed as a hero, both up below and down above, back then and now, in the book, Shackleton's Way, Leadership Lessons from the Great Antarctic Explorer, a model for corporate executives, or indeed, friends or amigos or anyone trying to follow, lead, communicate, or just get along and live as when all, as when all three of the Apollo 13 astronauts decided to quit bickering, stop nitpicking or finger pointing, let's stow the blame game, and instead work together, see it through, can't walk out, get it done, get along, hold your breath, gut it out, live together, and manage to return to Earth alive and healthy, disappointing underputters, no doubt, whereupon <laughs> NASA termed the mission a successful failure. Okay, so that's either endurance or adventures in communication. <laughs> um, I'm going to shift gears then and uh, read from In and Oz, which uh, you know various writers have called uh, different things. Uh, it's, you know, it's been referred to as like a Occupy Wall Street novel before there was an Occupy Wall Street. Um, or, uh, you know, I think of it as a romance, though not in the normal sense, I suppose. Um, you know, it's usually called like a, an allegory. Well, it is an allegory, kind of like Animal Farm, only instead of animals, there are characters who are named after their functions. You know, there's a mechanic, a music composer, photographer, designer, and poet sculptors. This figure that they can't, nobody can figure out who she is because she's a poet, but she doesn't speak. <laughs> So she communicates in, uh, by making sculptures out of dirt. You know, dirt's her medium. So how can you be a poet if you don't talk? Um, so like many people, the engine for the story is, is wonder. They begin to wonder, why am I here instead of there? Um, you know, why am I on this side of the line instead of that side of the line? And I think being here in Texas, that probably resonates even stronger, where if you're born on one side of a line, uh, you have a very different life than if you're born on a, another side of the line. So for Mechanic, this is kind of an existential crisis because though he lives in Inn, he can see Oz. Oz is sort of the city on the hill to him, you know, the city made of diamond dust. Think of fashion models and glossy and glamour and everything slick, while Inn is the dirty industrial uh, underbelly that makes Oz work. You know, it's kind of like we all like to ride in elevators where it uh, has stainless steel walls and glass paneling and we never like to think of, um, you know, the grease and the grime and the chains and, you know, all the dirt that makes the elevator go up. Um, so I'll just begin with the beginning and skip around and stitch together sort of a uh, short version of part of the novel. Um, chapter one. The dogs of Inn are snarling again, snapping at each other and breaking their teeth against the bars of their pen. They are mean dogs, dirty and of indeterminate breed, but with the color and size of dogs associated with fascism. Their owner, similar in look and temperament, hates dogs. He only keeps them because he also keeps thousands of shiny tools that he needs for his one real passion, working on junk cars in the garage behind his house, Beside the pen he has made of welded rebar, 
where the dogs spend their days fighting and barking and fucking and shitting and running back and forth, irritating themselves and each other until night falls and mechanic puts them in the garage to protect the tools. There are no dogs in Oz, or rather, there are no real dogs. There are police dogs and sheep dogs and drug sniffing dogs and watch dogs, but there are no car chasing dogs, no garbage can upsetting dogs, no, need it be said, poet dogs. The streets are very clean and traffic moves at the speed of commerce, which is to say, as fast and smooth as a concept car in a victory lap, as one woman, a designer of cars, might have put it. Fenders flowed from her Conti crayon so fluidly that without even trying, designer could doodle out a decade's worth of auto designs so that when thumbed in flipbook fashion, their tail fins would shrink, a dinosaur evolving into a salamander before growing back into dinosaur-sized scale. Advanced marketing loved her, but she herself began to feel as if there was something hollow, something missing in her sketches and therefore in her life. As others in her office sat at their desks, she, she drifted away on the clouds, allowing herself to become lost in the elevator music that played continually in the essence of Oz building, the office building where she worked. As every architect knows, the taller a building becomes, the more of its interior must be dedicated to elevators and their cables and lifting apparatus. And in order to make the essence of Oz building the tallest in the world, she thereby, and thereby have it speak superiority over all other companies and their second-rate skyscrapers, it had become necessary to devote the entire interior of this building to elevators. The hallways were elevators. The closets were elevators. The stairwells were elevators. The elevators were elevators, of course. But so were all the offices, and designer and the others who worked in these offices spent their days gliding up and down serenaded by elevator music as they sat motionless at their desks, applying the formulas that would spin off last season's style into next year's must-have rage. So here's kind of the moment when uh, Mechanic has his uh, epiphany. One day in inn, Mechanic was lying in sludge beneath a car. Utility lamp tightened his teeth when something within him snapped. No sooner had he gotten the filthy black underbelly of the car unbuttoned than he found himself staring into the gleam of silver gears, radiant with holy honey gold lubricant. Though he had seen gears like this thousands of times before, it had never once occurred to him how eloquently their polished metal teeth explained his life. Their mesh and power ratios may as well have been engineers and foundrymen, all on a shaft, with machinists and mechanics as his father had been, and the farmers and cooks as his mother had been, who fed the factory workers and highway builders, who made it possible for everyone to get the jobs that brought into existence the need for marvels such as cars, which needed transmissions, which needed gears, which needed him. So intense was the wonder caused by this glimpse at the world and his place in it, the mechanic couldn't have been more agape had he been the fish that spends its life completely ignorant of sea until it found itself pitched gasping onto the beach. Or a child who, upon overturning a rock and finding grubs reducing a rotten apple to dirt, is able to think for the first time, that apple is I. It was as if he had stumbled upon one of those forces that guide equally the planets in their orbits and the flight of an arrow, a force that had been there all along making the visible what it was, though the force itself remained invisible, unspeakable, unrecognizable, until now. Trembling and not knowing what else to do, he repaired the transmission and bolted it shut. But as time went on, it became increasingly difficult for him to forget about what he had seen, standing before customers who tried to describe the vapor lock, lock plaguing their cars by making a hacking cough, or customers who, with the erudition of medieval peasants on the topic of thermodynamics, explained to Mechanic the symptoms of a slack timing chain by imitating a spastic tick, he came to understand that the ignorant sought him out not for enlightenment, but solely to make the profound inner workings of auto invisible, to fix whatever rattle or misfire or stall it was that had brought some offending fuel pump or brake drum or other mechanism before him 
so that he could return it to the dark and they could go on being fish who wouldn't think about the sea until it broke again. Perhaps it was the continual barking of the dogs that finally got to him, or the continual whine of tires on the toll road bridge that the man lived troll-like below. The neighbors blamed it on the strain he had been on during the prolonged dying of first his father, then his mother, both from the unrelenting ugliness of the steel mills and oil refineries and the endless barrel and crate and gunpowder and acetylene factories that permeated in and so permeated its citizen employees, filling first their souls, then their lungs with a rust-colored stain. In any case, Mechanic found he could no longer go on as he had. He reached the point where he couldn't even pretend he cared if the autos left in his care were ever set right. The street rotters and custom car rebuilders who came to him were a catalyst in this, escaping into their fantasies of chrome oil pans and black lit leaf springs, airbrush tattoo art of virgins on the hoods, skulls in the door jams, bodies so beautiful that they made the essence of auto completely invisible. Indeed, fitting a chrome manifold onto a gold-plated block, he began to weigh down by his own culpability. His own, yes, moral sellout was not too strong a word. So the next time a customer brought in a transmission for repair, he unbolted it from the chassis where it hung bat-like in darkness beneath the car. Then he remounted it, upside down. Now the gear shift lever, which is previously stuck up between the bucket seats inside the, the car, protruded from the car's underbelly, while the gears themselves were exposed on the inside of the car, where they were all quite visible, dangerously visible to both drivers and passengers. What the hell, shouted the owner of the car upon his return. Their argument ended with mechanic throwing his customer out, keys after, the man's oaths to bring lawyers raining down, confused by the wild snarling of the dogs, flinging themselves against their pen to get at him. Um, I'll maybe skip ahead a bit then. Uh, the other artists in the book think that what he's doing is um, kind of cool. <laughs> you know, they think of him like destroying these cars as sort of performance art. But uh, he doesn't think of it that way at all. He just wants to, people to see how things um, work. So um, poet sculptor, you know, the poet who doesn't speak develops a crush on him as the story goes on. But he only has designs or eyes for designer you know, the woman who draws the sleek bodies of the automobiles that he's been mangling. Um, and as you can guess, after he begins making repairs like this, uh, mechanic's business falls off dramatically and he's forced to take a job um, on the toll booth that he lives underneath. Uh, maybe just one other little side note just to uh, fill it in. Um, here, I thought I wasn't going to be using any pictures today, but here's one. Uh, the uh, meantime, there's this sort of uh, war going on between the poets in the book and the um, ad write writers. Um, they're trying to um, eliminate billboards, you know, the poets are, because they just see writing ads on billboards as this kind of like, you know, like, like those slogan writers are just prostitutes with words, sort of, while the um, ad writers think that the poets do nothing but create static, <laughs> verbal static that gets in the way of commerce. So there's this, um, um, you know, they're, they're waging this political campaign by taking out space on billboards against each other. <laughs> uh, so that, that's kind of a back story here. Um, did it all come down to cash? From the vantage of the toll booth, the highest point in inn, not counting photographer's camera house, mechanic could see Oz, the Oz skyline, glittering like a city molded of diamond dust. The essence of Oz building rose highest of all, of course, and he looked onto it longingly, imagining designer there drawing mythical creatures that would morph into clay models, then real steel bent and welded by robots in the brown, palm-treed countries from which they emanated filling the roads of the world, including this one, the one that streamed by him in his toll booth. One dollar, 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 one dollar. 
I'm, I'm only reading across the top. <laughs> How much time do we have? Maybe, uh, maybe <laughs> um, before coming to the toll booth, he had no idea of the number of people who saw designer's art and were carried along by her art and were comforted by her art. But now he knew everyone, or everyone who mattered, or rather everyone with money, which seemed to be the same as everyone who mattered. Eight hours a day, he took a dollar from a steady procession of them and saw up close how the, her art shaped this human comedy, with harried businesswomen looking through the scrolling multicolored ticker tapes projected on the windshields so that they could follow stock reports without taking their eyes off the road. Or the drowsy, gently guided into the narrow lane of his booth by technology developed for the nose cone of missiles. Or lovers nestled within velvet clouds that had once been a dream in designers' mind while mobsters didn't have to lift a pinky ring finger to yell into cell phones that she, following the infinite wisdom of the market, had wisely drawn into their dashboards. When the power window of one car automatically lowered itself so that its driver could pay his toll, Bedouin flute music and the scent of jasmine rolled out from his private harem that was a mosh pit to the next driver, hard pounding techno trance socking out from her pugilistic sound system. These and a thousand other drivers passed by his booth, the other joy they took from her art, if it wasn't as invisible to them as their very breath, telling him how utterly uninterested they would be in the stuff of his art. Some didn't even bother to hide the disgust they felt toward him for breaking the dream of driving as he did, being there as he was to take their toll. One dollar, one dollar, one dollar. Hand out, dollar in. Hand out, dollar in. The mechanical repetitiveness of extending a hand, retracting a dollar, then extending a hand became a kind of mantra to him, lulling him to thought. He had a lot to think about. Soon he would finally finish the hydraulic broquet that he'd been constructing for a designer and thought of the moment when he would actually give it to her and it filled him with dread. She was so big. Such an influential artist, while well, he was, what? One dollar. <laughs> a fool for thinking what she had did and what he could do, or what he did, could ever be married? One dollar. One dollar. One dollar. Photographer and composer might say it didn't matter, especially photographer, but deep down, with the world voting in dollars and voting for her and her invisible cars, only a true fool would not have doubts. One dollar. One dollar. A horrid thought suddenly brought him up by the short hairs. What if a person could only see what he had seen by crawling under a car to see it? As if summoned by fate to illustrate what he was thinking, he spotted a figure far below at the base of the hill, laboring to push a bicycle up its steep grade. What if crawling through sludge, exhaling to collapse your chest so that you could squeeze into the narrow space afforded by a jack was the only way to see it, he thought, watching her. He could tell that it was definitely a her, pushing her bike up a hill that made walking easier than pedaling. Cars whizzed past, honking their horns as angrily at her as they honked at him in his car. Maybe if designer found a way to bring what he saw out into the light for everyone, if he could see something, but it wouldn't be it, the possibility made him shudder. Then he held his breath. As the bicyclist neared, he could see that it was poet sculptor. He could also see that she was pushing her bicycle. Unlike modern Oz bikes with their featherweight construction and delicate derailers that made pedaling uphill easy, her bike seemed to have been designed by a boiler company. Its brown primer colored frame had the rigidity and heaviness of the bridge, bridge's girders and, making it, and made easy, easing it into the line of cars waiting to pay their toll awkward for her. One dollar. One dollar. She moved in the line a little closer. Perspiration painted big oval stains on the underarms of her work shirt, its sleeves rolled up and revealing sinewy forearms. She had used duct tape to make a bicycle cuff on one leg of her standard factory uniform trousers. One dollar. One dollar. Then she was close enough for him to see strands of hair matted on her forehead, 
brush marks in the paint of her bicycle, her bicycle obviously having been painted by hand with leftover house paint. Hello, he said as she came up to his booth. She smiled, nodded her hello back, breathing hard to catch her breath, her face flushed, her flat chest huffing. She was radiant from the exertion. He hadn't noticed how beautiful she was till the work of climbing the hill pointed it out. One dollar, please, he said. She dug around in the mouth of a homemade metal purse that looked like a fish. Its scales were overlapping flattened bottle caps. One, two, three, four. Watching her count out pennies, reading her lips as she did so, he took pleasure in how easy it was to be with her here in the narrow lane of the toll booth. How easy it was to talk to her, to understand her, the constraints of the toll booth transaction keeping their conversation from bleeding all over into topics with no bounds, or the messy groping about that trouble mechanic in most other conversations where you could never really tell what was truly being said or what the other person really wanted. 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. She paused, looking up to him, and he understood that she wanted him to take the first half of the toll. When he did, their hands touched. 51, 52, 53. If only all of life could be so clear. As she continued to count, he racked his brain for a way to stretch the moment. What did men and women talk about anyway? 79, 80, 81. <laughs> Politics. Uh, I, I'm sorry about the vote, he stammered. The dismissive shrug he received in reply froze his heart. Leading up to the referendum on limiting billboard space, the campaign had grown more intense with each side pushing the envelope of billboarding while language did what language always does, and some of the anti-billboardistas began to appreciate writing on pages that were 20 feet high. To these poor fallible men and women who had never had an audience other than themselves, Photographer had explained the thousands of motorists who streamed by and read their words. Their words was intoxicating beyond bearability. In secret, they had begun to work against the limitation of billboards, a form of censorship. Some of the pro-billboardists, on the other hand, began to loathe the increasing difficulty they had in cutting through the poetic static, as they called it, with the poetry of their products. Secretly, they began to work to limit the number of billboards. That is, some of the anti became de facto pro, and some pro became de facto anti-billboarders, and in the end, voters decided by referendum to freeze the number of billboards at their new elevated level, which half of the pro-billboarders took as defeat, and half of the anti-billboarders took as defeat, and half of the pro-billboarders took as victory, and half of the anti-billboarders took as victory, though it was impossible to tell which half was which. <laughs> Had he insulted her? I mean, I'm glad, he blurted. Why had he stepped outside of the easy give and take of the toll booth? Again, she only shrugged, exactly as before, and finished counting out pennies from her fish purse. I mean, I mean, I'd like to see some of your poetry one day. She paused, giving him a wry, or maybe it was a condescending smile. I mean, your sculpture? Her head cocked like a dog hearing an odd squeal. I mean, your dirt. She placed the second 50 coins in his hand. Their hands touched again, hers lingering this time. Or was it just his imagination? The moment seemed to stop during which every detail was so vivid it made him ache. Her chewed fingernails, the sweet stink of her sweat, the whiteness of the balls of her knuckles made even more pure by the dirt in their creases that he knew from the engine grime under his own fingernails would never come clean. Not so long as she kept dirt as her medium. The driver of the next car honked impatiently. Then her sinewy hands were taking up the grips of her handlebars. But she nodded as she rotated a pedal into position, a serene expression coming over her face to let him know that someday she'd show him some. Well, goodbye, he said. She smiled back, then pushed off as happily as if the vote had never happened. A moment later, he saw her kick her legs out from each side of her bike as she allowed the gravity of the hill to speed her along, coasting the wind whipping her shirt tail as the bicycle picked up speed, her arms suddenly shooting up into a victory V as well. How did she do it, he wondered. How did she manage to float above it all? No more concerned by votes or cash or even whether people walked all over the dirt of the earth, 
not giving a shit whether or not it was her art. For a long time afterwards, he replayed in his mind the vi that vision of her coasting downhill, picking up speed, the wind whipping the tails of her work shirt as he tried to puzzle out the secret and why, even if he could, it wouldn't work for him. It wasn't that mechanic was unsympathetic to the claim made by poet sculptor Silence that the gesture of making dirt your medium was enough. He himself had gone on for the longest time without telling anyone what he had seen, and he might have continued to fix cars in the traditional sense indefinitely had he not begun to fear that artistic truths unshared had a name, hallucinations. One dollar, one dollar. It was just that it was hard to believe that the actual medium of all art was dirt, or cash, or that fashion was the most honest solution, as the designer maintained, dirt and cash being the yin to the other's yang, with sales as the only true artistic review. Every other judgment being a matter of simple preference. A gas gauge stuck on half empty, half full. Tomato, tomato, you, uh, you like standard vanilla, I like piña colada, so what's all the fuss about? But if that were so, then the swings between the seen and the unseen that so exercised photographer, the swings between the Greeks and their sculptures of beautiful bodies, to the medieval art of the unseen spirit that could start him frothing at the mouth, were of no more consequence than the changes in the width of neckties or the styles of hem lengths. He didn't know a lot about the history of art, but he did know a little about the history of autos or at least the standard autos that were once manufactured in Inn, the first of which was a plow. Turning from Oz, he looked onto the brownness of Inn, flat as mud except for the few decaying turn-of-the-century mansions. One of them, the house of an industrialist from the days when autos were assembled by human hands, had been restored and turned into the museum and home of the Inn Historical Society and Gun Enthusiast Club. One dollar. One dollar. As Mechanic mechanically took in the bills, he began to wander the displays of the museum in his mind, walking along with designer and composer and photographer and poet sculptor, taking advantage of the one perk that came with most of the jobs in Inn, the fact that as his body continued to do its work, his mind could leave, entering what passed in Inn for virtual reality. The first exhibit they approached was of, of a farm plow, which, as a pl plaque explained, had been manufactured by the blacksmith who founded the Standard Plow and Feed Company back in the days when the last of the Indian trading paths were becoming dirt roads. Poet Sculptor ran ahead of the group admiring the homey simplicity of a replica of the rough log cabin where the blacksmith founder was shown forging the first plow. For a generation, the company did well, composer read to the group from the plaque. But as in grew and others began to make improved standard plows, then the wheelbarrows, wagons, and carriages that blacksmith and sons had begun to produce, the company faltered and would have gone under if it hadn't been saved by the outbreak of the Civil War that allowed them to beat plowshares into swords and bayonets, which they sold to both sides at a very high profit. The next war, World War I, was even better for business, they learned, moving on to a motorized diorama. Sections of plaster of Paris farmland and painted scenery rotated into the underside of the table that the diorama was built on, while slag pits and factories that had been on the underside of the table rotated up to take their place in the growth of inn. Connected by rail as never before to sources of coal, steel, and lumber, the company was able to capitalize on a single design, the standard design that allowed them to output a carriage every five hours modifying each during production to be either a horse-drawn buggy for Sunday drives or a wheeled cannon mount. They also made their first horseless carriage, a motorized vehicle that could be fitted with a Gatling gun for military use, but was in fact first used to break up a strike by workers at a factory that supplied the rivets in its frame. The expansion that had been fueled by the war allowed the company, now known as the Standard Automobile and Armament Factory, SAAF, to again, sur to again survive the peace, this time making automobiles, black carriages with gasoline engines that had to be started with a crank. It was during this period that the mansion had been built, the great-great-grandsons of the original blacksmith having grown so very rich and powerful that once a president even spent the night in their mansion. A third shift had been added and production ran night and day. 
By this time, the shifts of SAAF were a kind of nature to the people of Inn. The factory whistle marking the rising and setting of their sons, who grew up to become their fathers on its assembly line, the photographer pointed out that this history was not so evident in the history of Inn that was written in the sheets of metal they forged. A history that ran from the black carriages to the sedans with running boards for gangsters to stand on to the amphibious troop carriers and rocket launchers of World War II. Then the tail fins and flamboyant hood ornaments when times were good, which fell away as times grew lean and the expected World War III remained forever just beyond the horizon. <coughs> Tours through the historical society and gun club always ended up on the top floor of the mansion, the ballroom. There, he composer, poet sculptor, photographer, designer, and the other visitors were invited to imagine and mourn the passing of the fabulous parties that were once held there. The ballroom situated so that the picture window at one end looked out onto the future that would become Oz, while the picture window at the opposite end had been aligned to give a clear view of the factory's main smokestack rising like a brick phallus from the abandoned workhouses, slag heaps and assembly lines below. A still living monument, the guide said, to the family's wealth, power, birthright, and legacy. One dollar, one dollar. If he ever rubbed a headlamp, mechanic thought, and a genie appeared to grant him three wishes, he would ask of the genie the answer to three questions. Question one, life. Question two, Death. Question three, stuff. Question three, stuff. Question three, stuff. Thanks. You know, it's a lot of rewriting, actually. So, yeah, I, I mean, a lot of it is, um, you know, I mean, it, it's mainly written to be read, so I don't know how well it comes across hearing it, too, because, you know, the um, um, sort of the, the things that echo off each other, I think, make a lot more sense when you can go back and reread things and stuff like that. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all about trying to get the ideas and play with each other. <laughs> What, was it okay? That, could you follow it? You know, here because I'm always curious how yeah. people. Yeah. 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 It was funny. You read it well. It was funny. I'm most embarrassed. I want to know why you choose to write in this way, and what drew you to a non-conventional way. Uh, oh, that's a great question. Um, well, as <laughs> as I always say, you know, we were talking about this earlier. Um, uh, I think uh, you know when I was uh, um, when I was y you know young, like an undergraduate, like a lot of people here, um, books just seemed to be these sorts of things that grew on trees. You know, like they, it never occurred to me that there would be a mistake in a book, or that a book would lie, <laughs> or you know, I was very it's, you know looking back on it, it sounds incredibly naive to me now. Uh, but I had my epiphany moment was reading Hemingway and, <laughs> and reading that, uh, and, and it's so clearly how heavily edited the, his work is. You know how you don't you could almost see the author's mind at work there, making these authorial decisions. You know, like um, you know, like people talk about Hemingway's naturalism, but you know nobody speaks that way in that book. Or you know, same thing like with Shakespeare. Nobody nobody talks like Shakespeare unless you're. You know, rap star or something. I mean, for God, you know, the, the lines rhyme a lot of time. So, uh, and yet people talk about Shakespeare's naturalism. Uh, so, you know, this picture started to form to me in terms of how these things are made by people to start with, and they're constructed by people. And they're just as you would build a building um, or, uh, you know, weld together some kind of sculpture, you would make a book, only you're making it out of words instead of some other material. So, so I guess um, trying to bring that aspect to the surface of the 
work is one of the things that interested me really well. Instead, you know, a lot of times novels get talked about as if they're this dream that readers inhabit. You know, they're kind of like a form of escapism. And, and I always have wanted, um, you know, my books anyway, to um, remind the reader that they are reading these constructed things. You know, to kind of be aware of it or to be uh, wary of it, I guess. And so, um, so the real subject always, or part of the subject for me has always been the way that language kind of shapes our reality, I guess. Uh, and that's partly what I think all of my novels are always about that, no matter what else there, there might be about. So, yes, sir. When you go into writing a book such as the one you read from, do you have a preconceived idea of something that you want to say? Or is it that you just allow the words to sort of bounce off each other for um, to entertain, as like you say, how they sound? Yeah, I, I, th I think com combination of both uh, different things, uh, you know, People sort of think that once you write a novel, you know how to write a novel, and I, I think that's only true for like you know kind of formula, formulaic writing. Um, most of the writers I know are, uh, and in any case, in my books, uh, you know, every one has been different. So, um, like Vaz, an opera in Flatland, takes up the subject of you know biotechnology um, and how uh, the um, body modifications are becoming ever more extreme and even down to the molecular level, even, even as they're becoming uh, more and more natural to us. So kind of like what I was saying about elevators and in and out, you know, we, we're, we're tuned to the surface and so we don't see the, the underbelly of that ever. Uh, so that, that was sort of the um, motive, motive for that book, but it kind of you know, evolved through the process of it. Um, one of the things that happened was while I was um, working on that book and I was reading a lot of the kind of um, writings about eugenics at the time, uh, you know, like, um, uh, oh, you know, the, the, the Nazis get demonized a lot, you know, rightfully so, <laughs> because they were trying to, they brought political power to this idea of how do you make a, a pure race. But uh, sort of the part that gets lost in that conversation is this, idea that um, um, almost all the industrialized nations were thinking in those terms, whether it be through immigration restrictions or getting rid of undesirables. You know, they're all very much worried about their gene pool being diluted. Um, um, and so they would have things like, you know, forced sterilization, you know, programs that were kind of up to the point that the Nazis then took and ran with. Um, you know, to get rid of undesirables, but, but in, and here's where the language kind of comes in. You know, the idea of undesirable, of course, is like a Rochard test, and for, um, you know, a lot of these people, undesirable meant unwed mother, or um, uh, alcoholic, or, you know, mentally handicapped, or, you know, there was a whole laundry list of things that that word meant. Um, so uh, that, that's kind of the moment where I see, you know, the intersection of language and, you know, the world outside of language inter uh, intersecting. Um, you know, the, in fact, like the Nazis, when they were looking for a legal <laughs> way to begin eliminating undesirables, they adopted an Indiana law to do it. It was called the Indiana Ideal. But, uh, you know, by kind of, like I say, demonizing Hitler and all that, we sort of forget about how common that kind of thinking was throughout of us. So that, that you know, that, that's the interplay between the two there. With, within and Oz, it was uh, completely different. It was um, um, kind of my toy that I would get out and play with when I got too uh, uh, depressed writing Vaz <laughs> or, uh, uh, you know, got stuck or, you know, just needed a break from it or something like that. So, so you know, it's a really different sort of genesis, I guess. Yeah. If that answers what you're thinking. No, I was just sort of curious to know what it was you wanted to say. Yeah. Yeah. This this book is uh, uh, probably I don't really write autobiographically, but uh, this book is probably the more autobiographic for me anyway. <coughs> 
Um, you know, it's set in Chicago, where I'm from, and I don't, like all these places have um, uh, s specific kind of references in my mind. I mean, I'm writing about real places, even though I'm writing them in this allegorical way. So, uh, you know, all these things in here are, <laughs> do exist, like the river that had so many chemicals on it that it would catch on fire. And, uh, <laughs> There, you know, there's an, af there's an afterword in the back of the book where, you know, the interviewer was asking me about that. And, you know, I think that was, that's one of those moments for me where <laughs> when I was young and you see the river catch on fire and the fire department come out there and <laughs> start spraying it with their hoses. And, you know, just, it's hilarious in a certain sense. It looks like a uh, Buster Keaton movie or something, but at the same time, it's real philosophical, you know, it makes you think. And so... Yeah. Is it pre-fracking, pre or...? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, completely. This is just, you know, the refineries and whatnot. Are we, are we, uh, so we got to move about, on. Yeah, it's about 1 o'clock, so let's thank... Uh,